Hi, everyone. We're going to give everybody a chance to uh, log in. So just bear with us for a second. We're glad you're here. Um, it just may take a minute. Okay, hey, I'm, uh, I'm going to start. Um, I'm Rebecca Gale Howell, and on behalf of the University of Kentucky's Lewis Honors College, I want to welcome you to our evening with Roske. Um, this event is part of the Lewis Honors Colloquium. The purpose of the colloquium is to invite local and national guests to enrich the learning experiences of Lewis Honors students and the surrounding community by provoking thought about wide-ranging, diverse topics. I want to thank all those who made tonight possible, especially the Lewis Honors College's Dean Laura Bryan and Dean Christian Brady, our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Council, our Department of Academic Affairs, the Field Office Agency, and the Kentucky Honors Roundtable. Tonight is the culmination of this year's One Book, One Lewis project. Since last summer, our college has been reading Ross's collection, The Book of Delights and we've been teaching it as a core text in our foundation seminar. The Book of Delights is a collection of essayettes, short lyric essays that are written as a kind of diary. On Ross's 42nd birthday, he sets out to write an essayette a day, noticing what he calls delights, those joys that make our days worth living. Along the way, his days also find their challenges like experiences with racism or toxic masculinity or grief. The daily writing practice takes the poet and his reader through these difficulties by way of the wisdom that love has to offer if we just pay attention. When we at Lewis plan to read and teach the Book of Delights, COVID-19 was not a word. We could not yet have imagined many upheavals that we have all sustained in this season. This is to say, we did not yet know how very important the Book of Delights would prove to be for us. Students have told me that Ross's book has given them a path toward happiness and resilience in a time when they needed it most. In weeks when their family members were sick, where their friends were involved in protests, or online learning was making them feel more than a little disembodied. They'd come to class and tell me what delight they'd noticed on their walk to the library while they were ordering lunch. Suddenly, they were seeing through the strife that seemed to be all around them. Suddenly, they had a tool, a new strategy for not just surviving, but thriving. One such student is our own Teja Sudakar, a Gaines Fellow and a Singletary Scholar, a Kentucky Honors Roundtable panelist, and most important to me, a true and honest poet. Tejal will be helping me host tonight, so please welcome her as she joins us to introduce Ross. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I am honored to introduce Dr. Ross Gay, who is largely known to the world as a poet and essayist, but who might choose to see as first and foremost a gardener. Ross is a founding board member of the Bloomington Community Orchard, a nonprofit devoted to providing edible agriculture and educational experiences to the community. As any reader of his writing knows, he is the caretaker of a robust backyard food garden, a sometime keeper of bees, and an avid lover of figs. 
Ross is also the gardener of communities. He is an editor at two co-op chapbook presses, Q Avenue and Ledge Mule, and a founding, a founding publisher of Some Call It Ballin, an online sports magazine. Ross also co-curates the Tenderness Project, an experiment focused on acts of radical empathy. In addition to all of this, he is a professor of English at Indiana University, the winner of the 2015 National Books Critics Circle Award, the 2016 Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award, and a finalist of the 2015 National Book Award for Poetry. He is also the recipient of multiple fellowships, including from the Guggenheim Foundation, the Radcliffe Institute, Cave Canem, and others. Ross has published four books of poetry and one book of essays, which is called The Book of Delights and is the reason that we're gathered here tonight. The Book of Delights is a collection of essays entailing Ross's personal journey with picking out one delightful thing he experienced each day for an entire year. Some of my personal favorites include nicknames, bird feeding, lying down in public, carrying a tomato seedling on an airplane, and babies, seriously. I choose to see Ross as a gardener because after reading all of his work, the thing that stuck out most to me was his ability to pay attention. Again and again, endlessly, Ross is thankful for the tiny but insurmountable gifts of nature and people, always acknowledging how, while the world of course takes so much from us, it inevitably gives more. If we're here tonight, we have somehow survived one of the objectively worst years in recent history, at least in my lifetime, and we continue to live in a period of global and political turmoil. Turn on any news channel or check Twitter for one minute, and it's so easy to get caught up in a cycle of hopelessness. I have always been someone who believes in the fundamental goodness of people, but because of this co collective hyper-awareness of all the death and destruction constantly surrounding us, in this past year, I often felt radical or selfish even for having hope in anything. The Book of Delights couldn't have come into my life at a more perfect time. Ross is not oblivious to the hardships that come with being human. In fact, he openly addresses them. The daily trauma of living as a person of color in this country, the unshakable loss of a best friend, or even just the simple fact of a bad day. But his commitment to finding delight in his everyday experiences, his keen eye for the flower in the curb, it's not just a meditative act, it's a political one. As Ross himself describes, the commodification of suffering, as seen all too often in the news, actually just obscures the systems that perpetuate it. What then appears to be a natural order of turmoil is in fact by design. And in such a system, hope, delight, it's not just a survival tactic, it's a weapon. Reading the Book of Delights gave me the tools to pay attention a little bit closer in my own life and start making my own list of delights. Some of my personal favorites include the stripe on my cat's forehead, confusing coconut milk for yogurt, um, a full water bottle on the nightstand, and extremely informal Goodreads book reviews. In a world stilled by a pandemic, finding and cherishing these small joys has been a challenge. There is so much in my everyday life that makes it easy to despair. And some days despair is not just easy, it's attractive. But perhaps like some of you gathered here tonight, I'm finding that the lessons I'm learning about paying close attention, the lessons I've learned from the Book of Delights have become more crucial than ever. Ross inevitably is a gardener of fruit trees, of vegetables, of poets, of soil and communities, and the power of delight is his harvest. Please join me in welcoming Ross Gay to the University of Kentucky. Oh my God, that was, <laughs> that was the best introduction I ever got. <laughs> we were talking before, you know, like I said, oh, it's going to be good. I know it's going to be good, and I, but I didn't think it was going to be that good. <laughs> oh my God, how beautiful. Thank you so much for that introduction. God, that was, that was beautiful. And, and when you said your delights, it made me remember, oh God, like this thing of like expressing, like shouting about what you love, it's, you know, it, 
it fills my heart up, you know? So thank you, thank you for doing that. Thank you for reading the book so closely and caring and for being you. Um, and Rebecca, thank you for having me here. Um, it's so good to get to be with you even in this, um, this way, you know? Um, I really appreciate um, your love and support. Um, I feel lucky to be in space with both of you, all of you. I'm gonna read, so you all know this book, it's, um, um, but for anyone who doesn't, it's a, a, um, a book that I wrote between August 1st of 2016 and August 1st of 2017. And I decided um, one day I was having a nice day and I decided I was gonna write a, um, an essay about this delight. It was like a delightful moment. I decided I was gonna write an essay about that. And um, I, was like, well, that's cool, but what if I wrote an essay every single day for a year um, about something that delighted me? So that would, that's what the project is. So this is not 365 um, essays, it's 102. I didn't write them every day, but I got close. Um, and so I'm just gonna read a handful of these essays. Um, I'm gonna read for, you know, just a little bit, and then we can uh, do some questions and maybe some answers. So I'll start with this one. <clears throat> this is called The High Five from Strangers, etc. Today, I was wandering the square of the small Indiana town where I gave a poetry reading at the local college. A feature of the small town Midwest, a city hallish building in the center, always with some sad statue trumpeting one war or another. This one had a guy in one of those not very protective looking hats they called a helmet during World War I. He's carrying naturally, a gun. Jenna Osman's book, Public Figures, alerted me to the ubiquity of the gun, the weapon, in the hands of our statues. A delight I wish to now imagine and even impose, given that beneficent dictatorship of one's own life anyway, is a delight. All new statues must have in their hands flowers or shovels or babies or seedlings or chinchillas. We go on like this for a while but never again, never ever guns. I decree it and also decree the removal of the already extant guns. Let the emptiness our war heroes carry be the metaphor for a while. As I was finishing circling the square, I passed a storefront garage with huge make America great again signs. It was a foreign auto repair shop and inside were mostly Toyotas and Hondas. I settled into the coffee shop where it seemed every other black person in this town was hiding. Every one of us offering each other some discreet version of the greeting, took my notebooks out and I was reading over these delights, transcribing them onto my computer. And while I was working, headphones on, swaying to the new De La Soul record, Delight, which deserves its own entry, I noticed a white girl, she looked 15, but could have been, I suppose, a college student, standing next to me with her hand raised. I looked up, confused, and pulled my headphones back. And she said, like a coach or something, working on your paper? Good job to you, high five. And you better believe I high five that child in her pre-ripped Def Leppard shirt and her itty bitty Doc Martens. For I love, I delight in, unequivocally pleasant public physical interactions with strangers. What constitutes pleasant, it's no secret is informed by my largish male and cisgender body. A body that is also largish male, cisgender, and not white. In other words, the pleasant, the delightful are not universal. We should all understand this by now. A few months ago, walking down the street in Umbertide in Italy, a trash truck pulled up beside me and the guy in the passenger seat yelled something I didn't understand. I said, como? The Spanish word for come again, which is a ridiculous thing to say because even if he had come again, I would not have understood him. He knew this and hopping out of the truck to dump in a couple cans, he flexed his muscles, pointed at me and smacked my biceps hard, twice. I loved him. Or when a waitress puts her hand on my shoulder, forget it if she calls me honey, baby even better or someone scooting by puts their hand on my back. The handshake, the hug, I love them both. 
Once I was sitting on a plane and shuffling down the aisle, I saw sitting at the front of coach, reading a magazine, my great uncle Earl. I got down on my knees and put my hand on his forearm and I said, Uncle Earl, it's me, Ross. He looked at me kind of quizzically, as did the woman traveling with him who did not look one bit like my Aunt Sylvia, which made me look back at my not Uncle Earl who looked maybe like my Uncle Earl's second cousin 20 years ago. And though it was benign and no one was hurt, it was a little weird and they looked confused. All the same, given his Uncle Earl died about six months later, I'm delighted I got to see him and touch him gently, lovingly, about a thousand miles away. And this next one I'm gonna read is called um, Nicknames. And this has a uh, common friend uh, of, of Rebecca's and mine, um, has a big a starring role in the beginning of this essay. Nicknames. I'm writing in a notebook with the words, pay attention on the front, which is a cousin to another notebook in my bag with the words, pay attention motherfucker on it, printed on a Chandler and Price letterpress that I co-own with my friend, which I have yet to see for it is lodged in a print shop in Lubbock, Texas. My beloved co-owner pal, which makes him kind of spouse, I suppose, who gifted me these delightful notebooks is named Boogie or Boogs and was so named by me, one of my greatest literary achievements. Boogie or Boogs might not be the first name you'd assign to Boogie or Boogs for a number of reasons. Perhaps the most significant of which is that he has probably, he has definitely not spent a lot of time dancing. Boogie, which you might ascertain from his appearance which would be a wrong thing to do, though you'd be right. This is one of the reasons Boogie, or Boogs, is such a great nickname. It's a kind of curveball that has, with much repetition, become utterly natural. And his Christian name, Curtis, has come to seem awkward and clunky, kind of Lutheran, kind of Kurt. It's a clothesline of a name, really, the football kind. Another reason I love this nickname and have now come to love how much I love this nickname is because Boogie doesn't know that every time I say his name, I am also invoking the great and similarly nicknamed El Boogie or Lauren Hill, whom I am guessing wrongly, probably rightly, Boogie has never boogied to. Boogie calls me Salpicon, which he tells me means sizzle. And I think that fits. Though it would be a safe assumption, given my own delight, that the nickname Salpicon might afford Boogie some similarly pleasurable, ironic association, which I don't need to know about. I've shortened my nickname to Picon, whatever that means. Anyway, I love nicknames. They delight me. There are evidently people from whom nicknames are repelled like projectiles from Luke Cage's skin, fried eggs to Teflon. My friend Patrick is one, Though the simple Spanishification of his name, Patricio, time to time, among some of us, is one that has endured, sort of, time to time. Drop the pa, jiggle the spelling, and it might be a good sticky name, Patricio. One that in a generation or two might become associated incorrectly and beautifully and so correctly with something Arboreal, something to do with trees. How delightful is that? I am a bit of a nickname magnet and have been assigned the following aliases. Biz Quick, Biz, Rahim, the Compassionate, Beef, Beefy, Big Man, Bigs, Biggie, Big Little Big, Big Papa, the Big Gay, Bones, Baby Boy, Baby Gay, the Baby, Booger, Beast, Sammy, Saucy, Saucy Sauce, Saucy Pants, Dr. Sauce, Dr. Hot Sauce, Doc, the Doctor, Tall Lady, Tall Drink, Wave, Aros Compoyo, Ross the Boss, the King of Applesauce, Roski, Snozzer, Six, Sace, Unky, Daddy, and several others too lewd or private to share. I don't know exactly what nicknames mean, Though a quick reading of mine and the abundance of the buh 
sound, that babyest of sound, makes me think it might be primal. I know that I rarely call the people I love by their names. I call them, if it's okay with them, by the name I have given them. I wonder if this means I think of my beloveds as my children. That seems very patronizing, especially because I mostly don't give them money. But on the other hand, how lovely all my mothers, all my babies. Um, that nickname Biggie of mine in there, I'm just realizing, oh, that's, that's uh, my, um, my dad's grandmother's name. And I've been writing about her this week. Okay, this is called Weirdly Untitled. Yesterday, I read poems at the Abraham Heschel School on 60th Street to a group of 20 or so fairly attentive 11th graders. Some were very attentive, budding poets that they were, hanging around to chat with me after the reading. One kid was even so bold as to stick around after the rest of his crew had dispersed to quietly ask, do you ever write stoned? Though I don't, I in no way discourage the child from indulging which I worried about for a few seconds as I was leaving the school, walking down 60th toward Columbus Circle in a windstorm, hoping I didn't condemn that child to a life of sorrow. My favorite of the stragglers, go figure, was a light-skinned, fluffy Afro child with an Africa medallion straight out of a multi culty tribe called Quest video. Better yet, straight out of a Jungle Brothers or a De La Soul video. That's it. He was so De La. He also had a Black Panther's pin above his heart on his sweatshirt. He could have been me in 1989 with my Ethiopia pin affixed to my collar, which in Levittown, Pennsylvania, was as much a fly in the buttermilk move as this child's here at Heschel's school. But not so much, given as Heschel marched with King, given as we were in Manhattan, given the long, if complicated, political companionship between Blacks and Jews. And Levittown was built as an exclusionary community, a segregated community about 20 miles north of Philadelphia, conceived of almost in anticipation of Brown v. Board of Education, the inauguration of an era of great racist innovation, turns out. My brother's first house in Lemoyne, Pennsylvania, had a clause in the title that prohibited it from being sold to a colored person, which he is indulge the anachronism, it was in the title. And he seemed to enjoy at least a touch, the filthing, the soiling, his body in that space was. The filthing, the squadron of filth he calls his family is. Actually, he barely mentioned it. I enjoyed the filthing. I trust you understand with my word choice, I am employing, deploying, a kind of harsh irony, which works if it works, because you discern a proximity to a true sentiment, a familiarity with a true sentiment. The sentiment my white mother's grandmother, my family, expressed by wiping her hand on her apron after shaking reluctantly my father's hand, which is by now a cliche based on truth. A truth that occurred among other places in Verndale, Minnesota, in 1971. As my mother gets older and in moments of openness, she has begun sharing more of her early life with my father. The family stuff, the this apartment is no longer available stuff, the you have doomed your children, they will be fucked in the head stuff. It is no special doom they have condemned us to. Neither is our head fuck especially special. The other night, I was driving my mother home from the movie Loving about the story behind the Supreme Court case that banned the ban on interracial marriage. Which about the court case that banned the ban on interracial marriage, which my mom kind of loved and I kind of didn't. That came out wrong. I love the ban or I love the ban of the ban, the Supreme Court ruling, I love it. I just thought the movie was a two-dimensional reinscription of hetero boringness. 
She told me my dad, to whom she was married for about 35 years until he died, said to her early on, I might be making too much trouble for you. Maybe we shouldn't do this. But, you know, they did. This is called Babies, Seriously. Today, while I was reading on the airplane with my knees smashed into the seat in front of me, a couple of things that happen in this book a lot is travel, some airplanes, and closeness, proximity, being in space together. I'm more attuned to that these days. Today, while I was reading on the airplane with my knees smashed into the seat in front of me, a toddler toddled down the aisle in her pink onesie with the panda head hood. She was a remarkably postured little creature, like so many of her ilk, and bold, toddling toward the back of the plane in front of her mother, who was doing a good job of letting the tot explore. But as the baby got near my row, the man in front of me, with his sleeping mask slid up on his forehead, widened his eyes and smiled manically, making kissing noises at the baby. He spoke a language I didn't understand, but the sounds he was making to this baby, which with his traveling companions became a chorus of sounds, made me wonder if baby talk is a universal or universalish language, for I understood exactly what they were saying and how nice of God to make this exception around the language between babies and adults. Anyhow, the man was so enchanted with this petite uh, creature with wisps of hair, feathery and north and big eyes that he couldn't resist first poking the child's tummy before scooping the squirt onto his knee where she stood bouncing and grinning, looking back to her mom who looked a touch nervous before being set free and retreating back down the aisle and returning again, upon which the choir of babbling would commence. Everyone reaching toward the munchkin, picture the halftime show at a basketball game when the mascot bazooka's t-shirts into the crowd, scooping her up and again and again until I was so flabbergasted by the endurance of love and delight incited by this child to whom I presume none of these people was related a love and delight that seemed analogous to the one that makes some people struggle not to eat the faces of babies, that I found myself, despite the very engrossing book I was reading about something horrible, laughing out loud and babbling with them and convinced again of something deeply good in us. This is called cup licking, cup licking. Today I found myself, I adore that construction for its Whitmanian assertion of multitudinousness, licking the little remains, the little remnants from the coffee dribbling down the rim of my cup. More fastidious than lascivious, kind of cleaning the cup like a raccoon. The first time I noticed someone doing this, it was my friend, my professor, Susan Blake. I was back at Lafayette College on a teaching fellowship and we were meeting over lunch to talk about me co-teaching the Invisible Man Unit. She got a warm up on her coffee as we were eating dessert, pumpkin pie, I think. And I noticed her lick the cup, unselfconsciously removing the dribble stains. I can't recall if she looked to see how thorough a job she did, though I usually do and I'll touch up where I've missed. Nor do I recall if she licked the cup more than once, though I assume she did, because I do, and she was my teacher in licking the cup. I think I wondered when she licked the cup, dragging her broad tongue against the porcelain, if she was flirting, if cup licking was a way middle-aged people communicate desire. Being a middle-aged person now, it's no surprise that I worry that any odd gesture might smuggle with it the possibility for misperception as flirting with beginning aged people, some of whom I teach 
And that, friends, is a losing battle. By which I mean to say, I don't think she was flirting. And if I lick the cup while in the presence of students, I do it surreptitiously and never while making eye contact. When Professor Blake, which she forbade me from calling her, forbade me from calling her, and so made me a kind of adult. When Susan generously read the first two chapters of my dissertation, she asked me, without meaning to hurt my feelings, if I spent anywhere near as much time on my prose as I do my poems. When she handed the 60 or so pages back, all sliced up with red penned comments, she also handed me a handbook kind of book called Writing Prose, ninth edition, with the ugliest teal cover ever. How do we thank our dead teachers? Uh, this one's called The Janky. The Janky. Yesterday, I was working in the yard, getting it into some kind of order. Order, a very loose usage in this case. And I noticed the gumi bush with its thousands of unripe speckled berries crowding the blueberry bush, shading it almost completely. I grabbed a rickety one-armed magenta rocking chair I'd plucked from the street on trash day a couple years back, and I wedged it beneath the light hogging gumi branches such that nothing needed to be cut. And the gumi branches became a kind of arbor over the rickety one-armed chair in case someone decided to sit in it, which I wouldn't recommend. As I stepped back to admire my work, I thought, rubbing my chin, now that's janky. Just like the pear tree whose limb I spread with my friend Brooks' old Adidas trail runner, with her permission, of course. And like the old window, I propped on a stray log to make a little hot box for my squash, cucumber, and watermelon starts. So janky. One of the many delights of a garden I'm finding are the ways it encourages jankiness, something about the delirium incited by lily blooms or the pollinators swooning over the bush cherry interrupts one's relation to commerce, perhaps. The garden makes you grab the nearest thing so you can keep crawling through it. It might be that the logics of delight interrupt the logics of capitalism. Aside, shouldn't we pause to admire the onomatopoeicness of janky? Because no word I know sounds more like my crooked shed door, sounds more like duct tape being ripped from the roll. To be clear, my folks, my efforts are janky are modest compared to my folks from whom I learned it in part, probably to their upwardly mobile chagrin, which is a good place to say the plain, which is that janky is a class designation. It often implies a degree of judgment often by people still haunted by and sprinting from the tendrils of poverty about broke people, about broke people things. I'm no longer a broke person. And so you would be right to read my affinity for the jank complicatedly with a nod to privilege and inheritance both. My folks were mostly, mostly broke people who had neither the time nor the resources to always fix things the boring way which is called replacement. And so the hatchback cracked up by a trash truck, the insurance money for which they needed to pay some bills got fixed, affixed with a bungee cord. Me and my brother's wristbands were made of the tops of striped tube socks. The hammer we kept under the seat to tap the stuck starter until it went completely kaput. A rectangle of sheet metal screwed into the rusted out floorboard of the Corolla a sheet of plywood tossed over the dinner table for holiday dinners, taped glasses, shoe goo, duct tape car hood. Oh, I could go on. I think I'm advocating for a kind of innovation or an innovative spirit, which seems often to be occasioned by deprivation or being broke or broke ass, which condition I am adamantly not advocating. But I am advocating for the delight one feels making a fire pit with the inside of a dryer or keeping the dryer door shut with an exercise band, which is probably caused by endorphins released from a bout of cognitive athleticism. 
which is also called figuring something out, which is something we all go to school, some of us for years and years to forget how to do. I think I'll read four more. Maybe three, definitely, definitely, definitely three. Tomato on board. What you don't know until you carry a tomato seedling through the airport and onto a plane, is that carrying a tomato seedling through the airport, you know, I'm kind of laughing because, <laughs> because I, want, I want to be like, this is, this is true. But these are all kind of true, you know, it's all happened. What you don't know until, carrying a until you carry a tomato seedling through the airport and onto a plane, is that carrying a tomato seedling through the airport and onto a plane will make people smile at you almost like you are carrying a baby, a quiet baby. I did not know this until today, carrying my little tomato about three or four inches high in its plastic park starter pot, which my friend Michael gave to me, smirking about how I was going to get it home. Something about this at first felt naughty, not comparing a tomato to a baby, but carrying the tomato onto the plane. And so I slid the thing into my bag while going through security, which made them pull the bag for inspection. When the security guy saw it was a tomato, he smiled and said, I don't know how to check that. Have a good day. But I quickly realized that one of its stems, which I almost wrote as arms, was broken from the jostling. And it only had four of them. So I decided I'd better just carry it out in the open. And the shower of love began. It was a shower of love I also felt while carrying a bouquet of lilies through the streets of Rome last summer. People, maybe women especially, maybe women my age-ish and older especially, smiling with approval. A woman in a house dress beating out a rug on a balcony actually shouted, bravo! An older couple holding hands both smiled at me and pulled into each other, knitting their fingers together. My showers might have been disappointed to know I was not giving the lilies to a sweetheart, but to my friends Damiano and Moira, who had translated a few of my poems into Italian and were so kind as to let me stay at their place a couple nights while I was passing through. On the way to the vegetarian restaurant Damiano's ex-wife owns with her partner, we walked by what I'm pretty sure Damiano said was the biggest redbud tree in the world. It stretched for yards, lounging periodically onto the mossy earth. Its beautiful black bark glistened by the streetlights. Though translation is an act of love, so my showers needn't be disappointed at all. Before boarding the final leg of my flight, one of the workers said, nice tomato, which I don't think was a come on. And the flight attendant asked about the tomato at least five times, not an exaggeration, every time calling it my tomato. Where's my tomato? How's my tomato? You didn't lose my tomato, did you? She even directed me to an open seat in the exit row. Why don't you guys go sit there and stretch out? I gathered my things and set the little guy in the window seat so she could look out. When I got my water, I poured some into the little guy's container. When we got bumpy, I put my hand on the little guy's container, careful not to snap another arm off. And when we landed and the pilot put the brakes on hard, my arm reflexively went across the seat, holding the little guy in place, the way my dad's arm would when he had to brake hard in that car without seat belts to speak of in one of my very favorite gestures in the Encyclopedia of Human Gestures. This is called loitering. I'm sitting at a cafe in Detroit where in the door window is the sign with the commands, no loitering, no soliciting, stacked like an anvil. I have a fiscal relationship with this establishment, which I developed by buying a coffee and which makes me a patron. And so even though I subtly dozed in the late afternoon sun pouring under the awning, the two bucks spent protects me, at least temporarily, from the designation of loiterer. Though the dozing, if done long enough or ostentatiously enough or with enough delight, might transgress me over. 
Murdering, as you know, means fucking up or doing jack shit or jacking off. And given that two of those three terms have sexual connotations, it's no great imaginative leap to know that it is a repressed and repressive sexual and otherwise culture, at least, that invented and criminalized the concept. Someone reading this might very well keel over considering loitering a concept and not a fact. Such are the gales of delight. The Webster's definition of loiter reads thus, to stand or wait around idly without apparent purpose and to travel indolently with frequent pauses. Among the synonyms for this behavior, are linger, loaf, laze, lounge, lollygag, dawdle, amble, saunter, meander, putter, dilly-dally, and mosey. Any one of these words in the wrong frame of mind might be considered critique or noun epithet. You lollygagger or loafer. Indeed, Lollygag was one of the words my mom would use to cajole us while jingling her keys when she was waiting for us, which, judging from the visceral response I had when I was writing that memory, must not have been quite infrequent. All of these words to me imply having a nice day. They imply having the best day. They also imply being unproductive which leads to being, even if only temporarily, non-consumptive. And this is a crime in America and more explicitly criminal depending upon any number of quickly apprehended visual cues. For instance, the darker your skin, the more likely you are to be loitering. Though a Patagonia jacket could do some work to disrupt that perception. A Patagonia jacket, colorful pants, tree-torn sneakers with short socks, an Ivy League ball cap, tree-torn sneakers, an Ivy League ball cap, and a thick book, not the Bible, and you're almost golden. Almost. There is a Venn diagram someone might design, several of them, that will make visual our constant internal negotiation towards safety. And like the best comedy, it will make us laugh hard before saying, Lord. It occurs to me that laughter and loitering are kissing cousins as both bespeak an interruption of production and consumption. And it's probably for this reason that I have been among groups of non-white people laughing hard who have been shushed in a Cadoba in Bloomington, in a bar in Fishtown, in the Harvard Club, at Harvard. The shushing perhaps reminds how threatening to the order are our bodies in non-productive, non-consumptive delight. The moment of laughter not only makes consumption impossible, you might choke, but if the laugh is hard enough, if the shit talk is just right, food or drink might fly from your mouth. If not, and this kind of hurts your nose. And if your body is supposed to be one of the consumables, if it has been, if it is one of the consumables around which so many ideas of production and consumption have been structured in this country, well, there you go. There is a Carrie Mae Weems photograph of a woman in what looks to be some kind of textile factory, factory with an, an angel embroidered to the left breast of her shirt where her heart resides. The woman, like the angel, has her arms splayed wide, almost in ecstasy, as though to embrace everything. So in the midst of her glee is she. Every time I see that photo, after I smile and have a genuine bodily opening on account of witnessing this delight, which is a moment of black delight, I look behind her for the boss. Uh oh, I think you're in a moment of non-productive delight, heads up. Which points to another of the synonyms for loitering, which I almost wrote as delight, taking one's time. 
For while the previous list of synonyms allude to time, taking one's time makes it kind of plain. For the crime of loitering, the idea of it is about ownership of one's own time, which must be sometimes wrested from the assumed owners of it, who are not you, back to the rightful, who is. And while having interpolated the policing of delight such that I am on the lookout for the overseer, even in photos I have studied hundreds of times, on the lookout always for the policer of delight, my work is studying this kind of glee, being on the lookout for it and aspiring to it, floating away from the factory as she seems to be. And I think I'll read you one more. This is called Pulling Carrots. Pulling Carrots and on a garden one. Today we pulled the carrots from the garden that Stephanie sowed back in March. She planted two kinds, a red kind shaped like a standard kind and a squat orange kind with a French name, a kind I recall the packet calling a market variety, probably because like the red kind, it's an eye catcher. And sweet, which I learned nibbling a couple of both kinds like Bugs Bunny as I pulled them. The word kind meaning type or variety, which you have noticed I have used with some flourish, is among the delights, for it puts the kindness of carrots front and center in this discussion. Good for your eyes, yummy, etc. In addition to reminding us that kindness and kin have the same mother, maybe making those to whom we are kind our kin, to whom even those we might be. And that circle is big. These are kinds I'm thinking as I snip the feathery green tops, making my way through the pile, holding the root in one hand, feeling the knobs and grains, the divots where they've grown against a rock or some critter nibbled, or the four or five of the red kind that have almost become two carrots, carrot legs in need of some petite pantaloons. The utterly forgettable magic of the carrot, which applies as well to the turnip and radish, and potato, and garlic, and onion, and ginger, and turmeric, and yam, and sunshok, and shallot, and salsify, and maca, and sweet potato. Is that because much of the food resides under the ground, it probably had to be discovered, uncovered. And after the discovering and the uncovering, Choosing which ones to replant and 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 replant until there was the long red kind I'm brushing the soil from until the squat kind piling up at the bottom of the basket. It was kindness. They are our family. Thank you. Oh my God, Ross, thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> this moment is always so awkward on Zoom. If we were all together, we could hug and feel each other be so thankful and um everyone's just stuck with me trying to say it for everybody we're all just so thankful mm. you're welcome um so keja and i are going to um, ask you some questions that our students have submitted is that okay with you that's great okay i'm still so happy about um, I just I just want to say it one more time. <laughs> that adds to my delight. That's another delight I get today. What's your delight? I missed it. I said Tasia's introduction was just so beautiful. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's who that that's who that lady is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um 
Okay, so we're going to ask you questions that were submitted by our students. Those of you who can see me and hear me, if you want to, we do need a clap feature, Kenton, that's exactly right. Um, if you all have more questions than um, what I have in front of me, you're welcome to put them in the chat and we will um, try to see them and get them answered. And uh, we're just going to have a conversation, so feel free to participate in that. Um, so our first question is um, so, sort of on the lines of how we started. Like, you know, the book is called The Book of Delights, but as you go along, you know, life happens. Mm -hmm. And um, you're not shy about noticing the hard stuff. Mm -hmm. And our students wanted to know, you know, what that process was like for you. Um, and if looking for delights helped you to see everything a little bit clearer, mm -hmm. um, you know? Yeah, that's sort of the thing. That's the, I mean, the, one of the things that I, like you can imagine, you probably have the same one, you know, you probably have the same sort of response. Like, okay, if someone told you you have to do this every day for a year, you might be like, hmm, I don't know, <laughs> you know, am I gonna find something to be delighted about every day? Um, it took a couple of weeks and I was just like, you know, once I started like with my eyes on, like looking so much, endless, you know, and if I had any time, you know, if I had sort of an open day, I mean, literally if I could hang around for two or three hours, I could, I could write, you know, three or four or five of these little essays. I was just, because the muscle actually got kind of turned on, something got activated and I was, you know, I was practicing, practicing something, um, which, I think it's interesting because one of the things that I was practicing was just noticing. So like your question sort of implies, it's like, I wasn't, um, I wasn't only noticing what delighted me. I was noticing more. I was attending to, I was sort of naming and articulating what delighted me um, in part because I think, cause I was sort of, I think I was probably aware of, or I certainly became aware of over the course of writing the book that my muscle for articulating what is miserable to me was much stronger than my muscle for articulating what's delightful to me. Um, and so the, the, that was one of the things that I realized, but um, notice just the more noticing period um, meant that of course, if I was sort of like trying to like just open um, more or attend more sort of generally, I was just gonna notice more. Um, so that, um, I don't know, you know, I don't know if, if like my, if my, um, I was gonna, I was gonna sort of, I'm wondering like if my sorrow increased as my, and I don't mean sorrow as a kind of devastating or, or incapacitating sort of thing. I mean more of like my, my sort of profound connection to other people actually, um, part of which is, is sorrow, the way I think of it. Um, and it, it might be the case that, that I think it probably is the case, <laughs> actually, now that I'm thinking about it, that, that my sorrow did, by which I mean my joy actually deepened. Um, I just got kind of philosophical and like throwing balls and stuff. <laughs> but, but I do feel like, I do feel like I was just attending to more. I was just sort of paying attention more across the board. So while I was attending to, you know, my sort of daily delight practice, I was just attending to my feeling more. Um, and, and as the book sort of, you go through the book, you sort of see that, oh, I'm sort of gaining a kind of articulation about this thing called, that I call joy, um, that is completely bound up with sorrow. That is actually, that is, that emerges, you know, the way I'm sort of thinking of it lately is like joy as a kind of residence and sorrow in some way is, uh, is some of the walls or something like that. Um, and um, that came out of that kind of like turning on the, turning on the delight thing, you know, just turn like pay attention, man. Like Boogie says, pay attention, motherfucker. <laughs> That's it, you know. That was, you know, that's the long and winding road for that answer. <laughs> so this sort of relates to another question, but you talked about sort of strengthening this muscle to find delight um, and still continuing to do that. So did articulating 
this delight ever take delight out of it? And in general, how do you balance like wanting to live a moment for what it is and wanting to record it in your writing? Yeah, it's such a good question. You know, like I have enough sort of experience with, you know, um, meditating and med mindfulness and the thing, like the idea of like being in a moment, you know, like that's enough of my sort of practice and understanding. Um, and <laughs> I don't think so. Like it, it brings me so much pleasure, you know, to, and it feels like a social, like a social pleasure, like a kind of binding pleasure to, um, to experience a moment by, um, by holding it in a particular kind of way. Like it doesn't feel necessarily, and, and I might be wrong about this. It doesn't feel like sort of pulling it out of the present moment. It feels like sort of like bringing it into these other present moments, you know, something like that. But it brings, but the experience of it brings me so much pleasure to know that I'm, re, I'm doing this sort of action, that I'm attending to it for myself, but I'm also attending to it in a social way. You know, so I know that part of this project is that I'm going to share these delights with other people. And I know just like, you know, Teja, when you were like saying the delights that you had, just like, boom, that like made my heart get big. I know that the, you know, unless it's annoying, you know, because sometimes I'd be writing these delights and so happy and I'd stop with someone on the street and I'd be like, yo, yo, you got to hear this one. And they'd be like, you know, I'm kind of late for some, <laughs> like a little later. <laughs> but um but yeah, it, I mean, I understand, I understand the, the question. Um, and I guess in a way I'm like, well, if this drops me out of time in a certain kind of way, I'm okay with that, you know, I'm okay with that. Along those lines, Ross, I had a question um, here that was like, what's your idea of audience? Like, in other words, mm. do you have someone or some bodies who you, keep in your heart as you're writing that you think you're talking to? Is it part of you? Who, who's a, your idea on that? That's such a great question. You know, I, um, I, I actually want to hear you say, talk about that too, Rebecca. <laughs> you know, like, like those, of, that's, those of us who have a kind of like a real voice, you know, like, not like, I mean, who voice is part of our, you know, like there's kind of voicey poets and voicey writers. And I think you and I both are that. Um, I, I right now it's funny because I was so, I've been working on this book for a long time and I said, I'm not gonna talk about it, but I'll just say a little bit, um, which is that partly what I've been trying to do is figure out who I'm talking to in this book. You know, and I, I'm so like, I love books that know who they're, like they're really talking to someone. And, um, and you know, like these, these sort of epistolary novels are, are not epistolary memoirs are interesting to me and they're moving to me. I think they're moving in part because like, um, it's like, oh, wow. Like, you know, so-and-so is really talking to their mother, you know, or their father or, or their you know, sibling or kid or whatever. Um, and I was kind of just thinking so hard about, have been thinking so hard about voice, which is a long way of saying, I think hard about it. When I was writing those delights, um, I'm definitely kind of the first ear, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm playing to myself and I want to make discoveries. I want to arrive at things, learn something through the process of writing everything, ideally, that I did not know before entering the, the writing thing. And then I also have these other things that I enjoy, like I enjoy humor, you know, and um, I enjoy certain sounds or certain like references. Like I'm making a lot of references that to me are like real good. And I know it's not for everyone. I know not everyone's getting these references. <laughs> And then I realized one thing, and it's like, it's so beautiful when I realized it. I read my, uh, I gave a reading in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I, my brother lives out near Harrisburg. And there would be things when I'd be reading, he'd be the only person in the audience laughing and he'd be laughing hard. 
<laughs> and I was like, my brother is one of my main audience members. Like my ear is so tuned, definitely, especially with humor. It is so tuned to my brother. And so even while I'm writing this work here, um, which I'm not talking about, it's I'm I'm really talking to my brother a lot, you know, and and um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I think about it all the time. I think it's a really a really beautiful and and curious question. I think who we're writing to, if we're writing to someone, you know, and those people could be dead, and they could be like the unborn, and they could be, you know, um, the trees and the you know the soil microbes or whatever. So one thing I noticed was that we both relate on how like delight is contagious. Like you identifying your delights makes me want to identify mine in my own life. And so this is a question from both me and a lot of other students, but do you have advice for um, keeping, do you have advice for students who want to start keeping their own list of delights? Advice about how to identify them or record them or anything? I would say, ask each other. I would just say, do it, you know, like however you want to do it. Um, I would say, don't spend any money. <laughs> get, get a paper bag, <laughs> you know, get a pen and just share it, share it, share it, share it. You know, write it, share it with yourself. You're sharing with yourself first and then share it. And to me, that's sort of like the, you know, what, what delights me about this question is that um, um, not only, you know, hugely like it is sort of wonderful to me to imagine a bunch of people just like sort of like, like being like, okay, that's my job now. Like I'm gonna sort of notice what I love. I'm gonna articulate what I love and notice it and write it down. But what, what brings me endless glee is more than that is uh, that, that we might share what we love, you know, that we might also share what we love, you know, and that to me feels like the thing, you know, that to me feels like the thing. Um, so however it is, you know, and you know, not everyone likes to write, but if you, if you like to garden and you can figure out how to share how you garden or, you know, or you like to skateboard or you like to dance, whatever, um, or, or, you know, you like to eat and you want to share that. Um, that feels good. That feels good. Um, to connect to that then, would you talk a little bit about the community orchard in Bloomington, what it is and how you got there and? Yeah, oh yeah. Um, so the Bloomington Community Orchard is a, um, it's a, now it's a, we just had the 10 year anniversary is, <laughs> so bizarre. we had it in October, I think, yeah, it was in October, and um, um, it was started by a woman named Amy Countryman, who's a neighbor and dear friend, and she lives right around the corner, um, and we, you know, we, we share a lot of stuff. Um, and um, she was doing an undergraduate degree at IU, Indiana University. And she was a little older undergraduate, but she was um, studying, um, she was doing a, a thesis on um, um, food security and food systems and stuff. And so she just did a kind of survey of how many of the fruit trees in the urban canopy. So the city managed, the or in city, city managed uh, trees were food producing and, you know, almost none. And so she proposed an urban orchard as a, as a way to kind of like, you know, address or consider or raise a question of um, food access, food security, et cetera. Um, so she ha had an advisor and her advisor was friends with the urban, um, urban forester in the city in Bloomington. Now Bloomington, you know, it's a small city. So it's kind of cool like that because you just can kind of be like, hey, urban forester, uh, I got this idea, you know, to some extent, or you probably know someone who could do that anyway. 
And so the forester said, well, if you have, um, if you can show community support for this urban orchard idea, we'll give you a little seed money and um, like let you use this acre. And, you know, Amy had a call out. I don't know, there were 150 people at the call out. We all kind of stayed with it, kept going. And, you know, it was, it was eight months later, we planned, I think that was on, that was sometime around now, actually, it was like February. And then um, we planted in October, I think. Um, and, you know, it was just like the most beautiful mess you ever saw. It was just a mess. Oh my God, it was so beautiful. Like, cause you know, it was like, you know, people who are drawn to these things, plenty of people at the time, anyway, me, I'm talking about me, are not like committee people. <laughs> you know, aren't like great at that kind of stuff. <laughs> So there are all these people who are just like, you know, like a little bit late, but man, they cook the best stuff for the potluck and all this stuff. And, and, you know, and it was, you know, our meetings. So we kind of pulled together a board. We were just like imitating the idea of like how you do a thing. <laughs> I shouldn't speak totally for all these other people, but for a lot of them, like we had to write a contract for the, uh, for the orchard with the city, you know, and this is, a, this is a legal document. And so me and my friend Stacy. <laughs> who's just as much of a mess like this as me. We're sitting in my house, like trying to like write a, a legal contract about like with the, an orchard in the city and the parks and rec department. It was the most ridiculous, helpless, beautiful thing you ever saw. Our meetings would be three and a half hours long. You know, all these people, a lot, not everyone, but a lot of people had kids and like stuff. It was just like totally, it was so beautiful. It was so beautiful. It was just so unprofessional. It was so amateur. And it was just a bunch of people who didn't know each other and like loved this idea, this idea of like a place where people could, you know, go get fruit, you know, people love this idea. And, um, and yeah, so, you know, it's been around for 10 years and there have been all these like sort of in the process at the early stages, there were these, you know, beautiful, complicated discussions. And one of the ones that I like to talk about is that there was a you know, a conversation about do you put a, a gate, like a lock on the gate? And, you know, there's thousands of dollars of trees and hours, a zillion hours. And of course you don't put a gate on the lock to the community or it's just ridiculous. Um, but we had to like come to that decision. You know, we had to come to come to that understanding, um, et cetera. It, it, you know, ultimately it it is a site where, you know, the, the amount of fruit that gets produced is, you know, it's just a little bit. Um, and it's all volunteers for the most part, you know, um, which may or may not be the best thing. I, I don't know. Um, but there have been so many, um, you know, it's just like a site for people to study and practice being neighbors. And, um, I think that's, that's the main thing, you know, people meet each other and they, you know, sometimes it's in the context of a, of a pruning class or a planting class. And sometimes it's in the context of like a poetry reading. We have poetry readings there. And Jean Valentine was the first, rest Jean Valentine. She was the first and only poet in residence at the Bloomington Community Orchard. And she came and she sat in the orchard. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Jean Valentine is just like one of our like most beautiful Oh, beautiful poets, like just such a, such a heart, a radiant, a radiant spirit um, and holder of us all, even if we don't know she's holding us, she was holding us. And um, she died on December 29th and, and just left, you know, gives us so much. Um, she came to the orchard, she, she like, <laughs> I was somewhere, I don't know, I might've been at Drew or something. And she was like, hey, I heard you have a farm. And I said, I don't have a farm. <laughs> and she said, I wanna come to your farm. <laughs> And I said, oh, you mean the orchard, our, the community orchard? Yeah, come on out. So she comes and she stayed with me for like three or four days. And she just, the chair is still there. Like we had a red, like a metal chair at my house. We just put it at the orchard and she just sat there. She wrote poems, she hung out. It was the most beautiful, the most beautiful thing. God, I was just looking at old emails through that, about that correspondence. Oh my God, it's so lovely. That was a long answer, but <laughs> but we needed to get Gene Valentine in here with us. 
So like the Bloomington Community Orchard and like gardening, do you have significant like hobbies or passions outside of writing and how do they inform like your poetry and your essays and your, your delight capturing? Yeah, you know, um, so I garden a lot. Um, you know, I'm a, like an arty kind of person. I like letterpress, I make letterpress um, stuff. Um, I play a lot of basketball, you know, I'm sort of serious about basketball. And um, I feel like all the things that I'm interested in are, um, I'm really interested in people like getting together and, and working on stuff. And, um, and I'm interested in being interested in it. Cause I'm also, I'm also like sort of a, um, What's the word? I can also not be like that, you know, um, self-protective, insecure, um, isolating, <laughs> et cetera, <laughs> paranoid, et cetera. Um, so I'm interested in, in things that are kind of, um, that are practices of, of getting people together. That's one, one way of answering that question. The other thing is that I'm interested in like stuff that also makes me pay very close attention, you know? So, you know, sometimes people think of like, you know, I played football in college, but like basketball is a sport that I really love. And people sometimes will think of, you know, like the idea of like being an athlete and being a writer is being sort of different. And to me, I think, to me, it's just practice you know both sort of endeavors are all about practice they're all about paying attention they're all about repetitions you know they're all about repetitions they're all about um you know the uh the the mis you know the the mistake as um as opportunity you know that kind of thing um so that's some stuff i'm into that's some stuff i'm into Um, so I'm looking at the clock and thinking maybe we'll ask you three more questions, including the one I'm about to ask. Is that okay? So I'm seeing in the chat and in the Q&A several questions about just like your process mm -hmm. writing the book. Mm -hmm. um, and some people are saying like, what was it like to write the last one? Some people are saying like, how, how did, I mean, you didn't exactly write one every day of the year. What was that, what was that like? And then there was one that was submitted earlier that was just written so beautifully. I thought I would just read it the way it came in. You can answer any of these or none at all. So this student asked, um, as a writer, is it hard to set your ego aside and accept the vulnerability that comes with sharing personal anecdotes and in this case, delights? Mm -hmm. Is there a certain way you cope with this? Or is this vulnerability something that you would consider one of your delights rather than a source of intimidation. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Um, so, you know, that, that, um, that, that ego question is a great question. And I feel like it's, um, <clears throat> it's not just a delightful, um, question either I mean I mean the question implies the question asks my answer I should say my answer is that no it's not just delight you know like vulnerability to me does not feel like delightful and I think there are all kinds of ways that I could imagine or speculate or formulate or postulate <laughs> about how I um, am profoundly armored actually against vulnerability, you know, um, uh, against the actual vulnerability. And, and one of my questions actually sometimes with my writing these days is the difference between vulnerability and the difference between performed vulnerability, you know? So vulnerability that is actually like, it's a kind of, it's an actual kind of exposure. Like it feels like if you got touched, it might kind of burn. Or the kind of vulnerability that is like um, it's it's rehearsed and it's it's we know this is vulnerability and, and you're doing vulnerability, 
Um, and as I, as I try to sort of write more honestly, I'll say that I am trying to be more attuned to that question too. The question of like, the writing that is actually honest in a way that is, feels, feels, I don't know what you say, like beautifully dangerous or something like that, you know, um, feels actually like sort of transformative as opposed to a kind of, you know, replication of like, you know, vulnerable writer guy. Um, that, so that's one part of the, my response to that, that long, beautiful question. The other part of it would be that um, there is something I think very sort of serious about the um, the kind of risk involved in expressing what you love, you know? So the kind of, there is a kind of vulnerability in, um, there's a kind of vulnerability in celebration or a vulnerability, yeah, in expressing what you love in part because people can be like, fuck what you love, you know, who cares? And that doesn't feel good. That feels very bad. And a kind of reasonable posture against that is say irony, where you're never really being serious anyway. You're never really being heartfelt anyway. Everything's a little bit like, eh. yeah, I didn't mean it anyway, you know? So it, it does feel like um, um, vulnerable in a certain kind of way. You know, at this point, you know, I'm 46, believe me, like I'm not like um, immune at all. Like I'm, I feel profoundly, you know, all of the things that, you know, I go to therapy, I'm like figuring this shit out. Like I'm like, you know, like <laughs> trying, I'm doing all the shit. <laughs> So I'm not like going to this figured out, but like, you know, some of this stuff, um, I'm a little bit like, you know, if people are like, man, fuck your, fuck your catalog, run a bash gratitude. I'm like, all right, man, fuck it then. You know, it's okay. You don't have to read it. You know, that's at this point, that's not going to hurt my feelings. Other things are going to hurt my feelings. You know? um, so that's all. So thank you for the question. And I think your question sort of implies that you're tangling with that in a beautiful way. So I'm, I'm, grateful also for you for doing that. The process um, of the book itself, I love that question about like how, what was it like to write that last essay? Um, you know, I will say it was, it was like one of these experiences of writing and it changed my life. And even, even today, I'm not talking about what I'm writing, but today I was writing something and I was saying about a uh, I had some line where I was like, I was talking about something that was making me smile. And as I was writing it, it was making me smile. <laughs> and I said, that's something to pay attention to. You know, that's something to pay attention to. Um, so, the, you know, the process of writing these delights, it was, it was, you know, time not feeling terrible, you know, at least. And that's, that's a thing. So to do that for a year as your job, you know, even though it's just a half hour a day and I didn't do it every day, but, but to do that as your job, because I'm a writer, so I gave myself the job to do this, felt nice, you know, it felt interesting. It felt all kinds of things. Um, um, it felt love in a disturbing in a real lovely way, um, but it felt nice too. And, um, so getting to the end of it was like, damn, this is this is something. Um, I can remember I was with my our friend Patrick Rosal in um, in Lubbock, Texas, and Boogie had actually visited us there like a couple of days before, and in Mar in Marfa, in Marfa, Texas, and um, I just had this beautiful day. I remember, and a friend of mine wrote me a letter. Um, and in the letter, she gave me the, the etymology of the word delight, which I had not yet looked at, which felt wonderful. <laughs> you know, I was like, whoa, <laughs> finally, I know what this word actually means, you know, and promptly forgot. Um, but it did feel, it, you know, it felt like, you know, maybe you can kind of hear it even in my voice. It, it felt a little bit like, all right, it's good. it was good knowing you, you know, it felt, that was a good knowing you. Um, that first iteration of this thing. Um, but also the thing that it 
felt like, which feels really crucial, is that in the process of writing this book, I realized that delight is very interesting to me, like whatever delight is, the word, however I'm talking about it, it's very interesting to me. Joy is much more interesting. Joy is the thing that I'm sort of fundamentally interested in. And I think is, is I came out of writing that book being like, oh, that's my inquiry. That's my, that's, that's probably the inquiry for my life. Like this joy question. And in that way, it didn't feel like I was moving past something. It felt like I was kind of bringing something into something else, you know? So yeah, yeah. There were these other process questions. So let me let me answer, say this one more question, answer. Um, because one of the things is that I did is I wrote them by hand. And um, and writing, by, writing them by hand, first of all, felt really good, very interesting. Um, I usually write um, prose on the computer, but poems I write by hand, but this was writing little essays. And I gave myself 30 minutes. So it had this kind of, um, it gave me a, um, the, the compression of time, it made me one, not, it wasn't gonna be great. I wasn't gonna be writing anything great because it was only 30 minutes. Um, it also made me think in ways that I wouldn't normally think because I don't usually, I don't usually think of like, I'm gonna sit down and write something in 30 minutes, you know, unless it was an email or something that I don't actually care too much about. So there was all this kind of thinking that the constraint of the 30 minutes made possible. And I think also the thinking that your body does while writing with a different technology. So if you're using a, a computer normally, if you write with your pen or pencil or crayon or marker or on a very narrow sheet or a very wide sheet, all of these things will actually change how you think. And it'll surprise you, but it's actually true. Um, so I just wanted to say that. And then also the last thing is that when I was transcribing them from the notebook into the computer, I was revising them. The first time I transcribed, I revised them onto the computer and I was ruining them. I was taking all of the kind of interesting, weird energy out of them. And so I didn't, I had to stop transcribing them for a while until I learned like how they were actually working and they weren't working how I normally, you know, I had to like let them teach me how, how I could revise them. And that felt like an interesting thing. So going along with everything that you said about vulnerability, um, this book was written much before 2020, but I feel that a lot of its principles are even more crucial now. Um, and so how do you go about finding delight even in very difficult moments? And did the process of writing this book help carry you through the pandemic in any way, or did it help you see it differently? You know, I mean, I think I, um, in a way it's kind of like the, the principles of what I probably learned or something or was studying or practicing are, are I think useful. And the principles are something like, you know, notice what you love, articulate what you love, share what you love, you know, that seems um, always useful and um, maybe maybe extra useful when you know you can't touch your beloveds, you know, a lot of your beloveds, or you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It 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 feels like. Um, it's always a good time to know when birds are singing near you, but I feel like, you know, it's a good time now to know the birds are singing near you, you know, <laughs> it's a good time now. If they are, and also to be able to be like, if, if, if you can't notice that birds are singing you, but you have a friend who can, you know, cause that feels like the thing too. Like, yeah, you know, sometimes it's, Sometimes, you know, the light is just like, it's like, man, the sun is, you know, you're under like a peach tree or a pear tree and like the fruit and you just can't see it, can't see it, you know? And, you know, if you could be like, hey, there's pears above you, 
just so you know. That's, that's lucky. Lucky on both sides of that. Yeah. Ross, we're just about out of time. So I'm gonna close with this last question. It's my, my question for you. Um, first, a preliminary question. Your, your first gen, college grad, right? Am I right about that? First my, generation? My mom went, but my dad didn't. My dad never finished college, but my mom. Yeah, my dad finished, my mom didn't. Okay. Um, I'm asking that because a lot of our students are first generation students and they're real high achieving mm -hmm. real they are they know how to cross the t <laughs> um and one of the things i heard a lot i hear a lot as we read this book together as a classroom community you know is like your approach to education your approach to being smart mm -hmm. is a bit of a revolution mm -hmm. for them and so I wanted to ask you, like, for you, what does it mean to be educated? Mm. Oh, I love that question. Um, I will offer a very preliminary, <laughs> that's like a long question. You know, knowing how to ask questions, knowing how to listen, um, knowing how to be disobedient, um, you know, um, it's, it's very interesting, you know, and it's interesting because um, the, you know, like what we consider education, you know, that, that one about the janky, like we go to school so often, you know, I, I finished that one, we go to school so often to learn how, you know, to, um, to forget how to figure things out, you know. Um, and in some way, you know, achievement in education, achievement in school, it seems to me, my experience as a teacher, but also as a student, and also as a bad student. Um, and I, like, I would not have gone to college if I didn't play football, you know, I wouldn't, <laughs> I would not have done that. Um, it, it seems that we often confuse um, compliance with um, intelligence, with uh, being educated, being smart, all these things. And we all know people who were so goddamn smart, but they couldn't sit down when we were little. And they just, they just, you know, you know, whatever. Um, and my dad, my, or my, my brother's a principal and he said a thing that made me so happy for his, the children that he principals, he said, um, he said, you know, compliance isn't like a high order skill. <laughs> and I thought, that, that's good. You want your principal saying that, you know, <laughs> you want your principal saying that. Anyway, that's all to say that, um, so I'm doing like a lot of negative, but I can tell you what I don't, what I think educated, being educated isn't. I don't think just following rules is being educated in the least, you know, and, um, but I do feel like something about listening and learning how to ask questions, um, learning how to ask questions that may not, may not be apparent to other people to ask too. I think that's, and that can be challenging. That's a kind of vulnerability, I suppose. Um, Also, you know, um, it feels to me like that to be educated, um, just, you know, like sort of wondering about, or at least being able to connect a little bit to like what your desires, you know, you know, and so, you know, what you love, that kind of thing, which can be very hard. I think it can be very hard to have any sense of like what we actually want, you know. Um, Also, you know, and, and this is going to be, you know, maybe um, I read, I think I read it in this book by, um, called My Meteorite 
by Harry Dodge. It's just so beautiful. But he was saying like, some, he was referencing someone else, but said um, the the greatest. Someone said the greatest technology we have is the mistake. I, I don't know who the citation is, but who said it? But the greatest technology we have is the mistake, you know. And I think Robin Wall Kimmer is uh, quoting someone else who says the greatest technology we have is a story. Uh, but say they're both pretty great technologies. <laughs> and I feel like, you know, it's really, um, there's something in, about being educated, about being able to like make mistakes, you know, just like, you don't have to be good, you know, you don't have to be good, you know, just like try stuff out, you know, try stuff out. And that's the thing, you know, like the better we get at stuff, the less we want to try stuff out. The better we get at stuff, it feels so often, the better we get at stuff, the less we want to like, you know, fail, quote unquote, fail, which is why I often use the word of like, it's all practice. Everything is practice where all you're doing is like practice. So I'm going to finish like that. I'm going to say education is like, to be like educated to me, and educated is even a funny word, but just to be like, you know, something is like to be, just to be kind of interested in practice. You know, I'm gonna practice, I'm gonna practice this. Um, might not always be get it right, but that's gonna be part of the practice, not getting it right, you know. That's such a good question. <laughs> So I didn't mean to spring it on you, but I sure am glad you answered it. Yeah. Um, we are so grateful to you for spending tonight with us. Thank you so much. And um, there's no easy way to say this, but thank you for asking questions. Yeah, you're welcome. And for sharing them with us. You're welcome, you're welcome. It's been fun to be with you all. Thank you so much. We send our love to you. And um, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. And